originally invited to speak at the uh, World Soybean Research Conference in a symposium organized by uh, Anders, uh, I'm not sure I'm going to pronounce his last name right, Huith, um, on a, uh, a general topic of neonicotinoids and their use um, in soybeans uh, for, um, for a couple of different pests. And uh, I think he singled me out because of the work that my lab has done um, here at Iowa State and with others in the region on its uses, uh, the seed treatments use against uh, soybean aphids. And um, he was looking for panelists to talk about both the pros and cons, the opportunities and limitations. Uh, I was going to go a little bit broader at that meeting that was going to be in Georgia for a broader audience, but since we're all here locally, uh, I kind of scaled it back mostly to the work that we've done just on the soybean aphid and not so much on uh, and, and its opportunities and limitations for using this technology to manage the aphid and not so much about what I think all of you might be familiar with in the news about some of the more environmental concerns that are associated with neonicotinoids. Uh, I've got some slides on that if there are questions afterwards, but I'm going to stay mostly focused on management. Okay, so just as a, a brief uh, review, neonicotinoids are a class of insecticides. Uh, they're nerve toxins, and uh, they have three kind of, uh, I wouldn't say unique, but really cool characteristics. One is that they're broad spectrum. They kill a lot of different insects, and they do so uh, both directly, if they're applied directly to the insect, but also through the systemic activity. They're taken up by the plant. And this is really cool because that can lower non-target impacts. If they're applied to the seed, they're taken up by the plant, and then only the things that eat the plant are affected. And there's really an asterisk there because there, as I hinted at the beginning, there are some non-target effects that have come to our awareness, but compared to broad spectrum insecticides that are applied directly to foliage, evidence is that the non-target impacts are not as great. One thing I should point out is they're a class of insecticides. There's a variety of them shown here in these uh, molecular forms. And if you're bored by that, don't worry. That's the last time you're going to see these. Okay? <laughs> Their first use in the Midwest of the United States occurred uh, back in the early 2000s. And this was not because of the soybean aphid, but rather because of an outbreak of the bean leaf beetle, shown here in this picture. Uh, the bean leaf beetle is a beetle, and it uh, can occur through several generations in Iowa. And early emerging soybeans are often hit first uh, because the beetle overwinters as an adult. They're very hungry. They go uh, uh, out looking for anything that, uh, uh, like a legume that pops up. And for a period of time in the late 1990s and 2000s, Iowa, Minnesota, and parts of Wisconsin were hit hard by this not only by the direct damage that the insect does, but also by the indirect damage of transmitting a virus, bean pod model virus, with some producers reporting up to 100% infection, which affected their yields and also the quality of the bean, uh, which both affected the value of the crop. By 2003, there were emergency exemptions to get these products into place in this uh, three-state region. And then the EPA had full approval for imidacloprid, or gaucho, and then thiomethoxin in 2004. And so this was available now for farmers in the Midwest. At the same time that this was a response to the bean leaf beetle, which was a regional pest and kind of comes and goes, and currently it's not much of a problem for most of our farmers, a bigger problem occurred. And that was the soybean aphid. Oh, oh but before I talk about the soybean aphid, uh, this shows the use of neonicotinoids uh, across a lot of different uh, scenarios. Crop chemicals, turf and ornamental, garden lawn. Uh, because they're broad spectrum, because they're systemic, because they're fairly harmless to humans, these have been put in use in a lot of places. But it's in the use in crops, like corn and soybeans, that dominates uh, the, the use in terms of pounds of active ingredient. And with the first approval in the early 2000s for soybeans and, and corn, Corn and soybeans are the dominant uses in the United States for these. And it's been estimated that up to like 90% of all corn has a seed treatment, a neonicotinoid seed treatment, and up to 60% in some areas, uh, soybeans. But that was all before what we now think of in the upper Midwest as our most important pest, the soybean aphid arrived. 
In 2000, the first detection of this invasive occurred in Wisconsin and was confirmed across the six-state region around the Great Lakes. By 2003, it was found across to Iowa. It's a small aphid, as aphids go. Um, alone, not much of a problem, but it can build up into large populations that you can see the evidence of them indirectly from the outside of the field. These aphids you couldn't see from a field. You'd have to go up and flip the leaves over to look at them. Unfortunately, uh, a drone scanning above the field may not see what, where they reside underneath the leaf. But if a large enough population occurs, you get the sooty mold, which is the growth of mold from the honeydew that the, hun that the uh, aphids has excreted onto the surface of the leaf, producing this blackened color. And that white flecking, that's not dandruff from the photographer. That's the excess, the, the, the cast skins that have fallen off of the leaves and collected on that uh, sticky sooty mold. If you get to this point, you've probably lost 25% of your yield. That's bad news bears. So as this was occurring, as this invasion was occurring and large populations were being recorded throughout Iowa, a group of us uh, wanted to know what was the best in terms of both in terms of management, reducing the aphid, but also in terms of cost effective way of managing the soybean aphid. And we published this back in 2009 by one of, our, uh, one of my pe uh, PhD students, Kevin Johnson, titled Probability of Cost-Effective Management of the Soybean Aphid. We looked at four methods, and we compared these across three states over three years in the early stages of the aphid's invasion. The three methods included an untre untreated control, no insecticide, a prophylactic approach. Whether the aphid was there or not, we were going to apply, apply both an insecticide and a fungicide to foliage. Because seed treatments were just coming in, we asked, okay, what if we just use the seed treatment? Full stop. No fully uh, applied insecticides. And then we used an IPM approach, where we scouted the field, and if the population had exceeded a threshold, we sprayed it with the foliar insecticide only. So what this looks like is the control, no insecticide, preventative or prophylactic, was a pyrethroid and a fungicide. And we timed that at the R1, R2 uh, stage because around this time, uh, we were hearing reports that soybean rust was showing up in the United States or could show up. And that was even a more devastating pest than the soybean aphid. And since it was uh, modeled to show up uh, into Iowa and some of the other states that we were working in, we elected to time this tank mix with the time that was recommended back in the early 2000s for a fungicide application. The soybean aphid IPM approach, we use the 250 per plant threshold. And then the seed treatment alone was just that, a neonicotinoid applied before planting. And we did this over uh, three years and multiple locations in three uh, states in the Midwest. And this is what it looked like across those three years. Um, this is on the y-axis, number of aphids per plant. You can see we got about a three-order magnitude range here, from very few, if any, to up to uh, about 3,000 per plant. And the aphids can show up in June, but economic levels typically don't occur in, until July or August. So 2005 was a year where we had an outbreak that occurred late in August, above that threshold. 2006, hardly any throughout the entire year. And then 2007 uh, was remarkable. Several thousands of aphids per plant occurring in the July and August time frame. So we're out there hand counting as we, are, uh, yeah, as we scout the fields. And this is uh, uh, what we would look like. This is what a 250 per plant threshold population might look like. So I'm going to break down some of the results uh, from one of our locations in Story County where we experienced that great fluctuation. This is 2005, and I'll show you a series of figures here. The mean yield per uh, uh, acre is on the y-axis, and then the treatments. In our first year, we just had the control, the prophylactic, and the IPM. We didn't yet have seed treatments available to us. But as you can see, no difference across these. We didn't really reach an economic level of aphids, and so no difference in yield, whether we spray it or not. 2006, again, not much of a difference. Yields were a little bit lower. Now we've got that seed treatment available to us. Didn't see much of an improvement. Statistically, no difference amongst those treatments. In 2007, the year where we saw several thousand per plant, that's when we saw the most dramatic difference in yield. So the control had the lowest 
kind of what my teenage daughter would say is no duh, he didn't use any insecticide when the aphids showed up. All of the treatments that got in insecticide had higher yield than that control, but it was those that got a foliar insecticide application that had the higher yield. The seed treatment did provide some protection, but not as much as a foliar insecticide that was applied later in the season, whether it was applied based on the grow stage or based on scouting. And if we combine all these data, uh, what we see is that, again, those treatments that received an insecticide had higher yield than the control. But of these three, the IPM was the only one where we sprayed only when we needed to. So when we go back to that year-to-year -year variation, it's only the IPM that we didn't spray in 2006. So it ends up being a more cost-efficient way of using an insecticide than a prophylactic approach, whether it's a seed applied or foliage applied in, uh, uh, application of the insecticide. Now, in order to talk a little bit more about this, I'm going to convert these data, these aphid per plant data, into something called cumulative aphid days. So cumulative aphid days is a way of taking messy data like this, which is aphids per plant, which looks something like that. It's just the estimate of the number of aphids on a plant at a single point in time, and converting it to a season-long exposure. So it's kind of like heat units. Um, once a plant's exposed to heat, you can't take that exposure away. Once a plant's exposed to aphids, you can't take that damage, that exposure away. So in the same way that uh, heat units are calculated over time. We do the same thing with cumulative aphid days. 10 aphids per 10 days is 100 cumulative aphid days. 100 aphids, 10 days, 1,000, you get the picture. And what that does is it allows me to take really messy data like this, where I'm going to compare a lot of treatments, and turn it into something like this, where the aphid days are accumulated, they level off when the aphid population goes away, and then I can just focus on this last number. That's the accumulation of the aphids exposure over the course of the season. And this is a way that aphidologists like myself and others look to compare treatments to see over the course of a season just how well a certain management tactic worked. Oh, oh, Sue. So this is how it looks like from that last study when you combine all the locations, not just Story County. In years where we had aphids like 05 and 07, we start to see some difference between the control and the, the treatments including insecticides. And you can see here, quite a lot of aphids in terms of cumulative aphid days, very few if any. This is really, really small, like less than a few aphids per plant. And then 07, a significant number more, enough to produce a yield difference. But even in those years where we had significant exposure, an IPM approach had the same yield statistically as any of the prophylactic approaches. And Again, that's data from an, uh, a snapshot of three years early in, the age, uh, early in the aphids invasion into North America. More recently, some of my colleagues uh, published a paper this last year called Assessing the Value and Pest Management Window Provided by Neonicotinoid Seed Treatments for Management of the Soybean Aphid in the Upper Midwestern United States. So this is an expansion, and it's a more recent analysis that includes Indiana, Iowa, Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Wisconsin in 2012 and 2013. And the authors note in this that in 2012, they had a very low, uh, very low populations to the point where their IPM approach was not applied because there wasn't enough to justify an application. But then in 2013, they had an outbreak such that some of these states, some of the locations in these states needed an insecticide application. And when they summarized that data for 2013, it looked an awful lot like what we saw in our earlier study. They're using a little bit different mix of uh, treatments here, You're using Apron Max, a control untreated, and then just Cruiser Max, which is that neonicotinoid alone, and their IPM. And again, in terms of cumulative aphid days, statistically no difference. So again, that IPM approach is providing the same amount of protection as a preventative approach. And one of the reasons why we think this is the case and why we sometimes get even better protection with a foliar application than a seed treatment is the nature of the seed treatment in the plant. So what these uh, uh, 
what this group did is pull leaves from the plants based on different growth stages down here on the x-axis and then measure the amount of thiomethoxam here over time. And this is in 2012 and 2013. And what they note here is a little bit counter uh, to what we typically do in sciences. They stages with no significant differences between treatments are marked with an asterisk. So the treated and the untreated here, these are statistically different, but those with the asterisk are not. And that starts at around well, early vegetative stages. And it's really in these late vegetative, vegetative stages and R, early R stages when aphid outbreaks, when aphids first arrive and then those outbreaks occur. And by that time, their evidence suggests that that seed treatment is just not in the plant to provide any protection. So in terms of the main points about opportunities and limitations, at least for the pests that we focus on in the Midwest, the opportunities for seed treatment is it's easily applied. It's something that a farmer can make a decision early in the season, plant it, and walk away. And to some extent, there, there is evidence that those seed treatments can lower aphid populations. But it doesn't last the entire season. In our uh, repeated experiments where we've compared seed treatments to single applications of foliar insecticide, is that that single application, especially when it's applied based on an IPM approach, is more cost effective. The seed treatment doesn't last the entire season. And if you've got questions about, well, what foliar insecticide, what rate, more of the agronomic questions, my colleague Erin Hodson at Iowa State University publishes what she calls the yellow book. It's, um, I'm going to uh, talk her up a little bit. It's the largest insecticide evaluation in the world focused on the soybean aphid. She has over 30 some different uh, active ingredients tested at multiple locations that she follows throughout the year. She, I was doing some of this before she arrived. She's since carried it on. I think we've up to 14 years worth of data. You can find these at our website here. So if you have more questions about how and what foliar insecticides to, to use, go there. But the larger picture for this is that uh, people took notice of this, especially the Environmental Protection Agency. And they used some of the data that we had published and some of my colleagues work throughout the Midwest. In fact, they went beyond just the upper Midwest and looked at the uh, entire soybean growing region of the United States. And in a publication that came out several years ago, they wrote, quote, the EPA concludes that these seed treatments provide little or no overall benefits to soybean production in most situations. Published data indicate that in most cases, there's no difference in soybean yield when soybean seed was treated with neonicotinoids versus not receiving any insect control treatment which I think is consistent with what we were seeing in the Midwest when we focused on the soybean aphid. But I highlight a couple of things here. One is little or no overall benefits in most situations, in most cases. And it wasn't soon after this was published that some of our colleagues in the South took notice in a rebuttal that was published last year in 2016 in a paper called The Value of Neonicotinoid Insecticide Seed Treatments in Mid-South Soybean Production Systems. What's the Mid-South? That's Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Tennessee, which combined equal about 3 million and some change acres of soybeans harvested, compared to about 9 million in Iowa alone. Not nothing, but a little bit smaller than what we see up here. And think part of the reason why that is is they have a more diverse region in terms of agriculture and they have many more challenges when it comes to growing soybeans because they have many more pests and many more serious pests than we do up here in the upper Midwest. They have laps, caterpillars, they have stink bugs, they have a variety of insects that we never see. <laughs> uh, and many of those attack the plant early in the season which I think goes a long way to explain why they see a more robust return on their investment when it comes to using a seed treatment. About $30 per hectare uh, improvement in the value of the crop when it's treated than uh, when it's not. So that's the seed treatment part of this talk. How much time do I have? A couple minutes. So then I ask, are insecticides the only way to manage soybean aphids? Well, take a look at this picture. Tell me which 
is the aphid resistant soybeans. Now, if you were paying attention, ah, I got one quiet guy pointing this way. So you were paying attention because earlier you remembered that a large outbreak produces a sooty mold. And these dark beans right here, are, that's not a varietal difference. That's an outbreak of several thousand per plant, whereas right next door is an aphid resistant variety. No insecticide was used here. We've been working with breeders, uh, including some here at Iowa State, Walt Fair, and some of his students, looking at aphid resistant varieties. We had one paper published a little while ago where we looked at these in small plots. We used what he, uh, are called rag genes, resistance to aphis glycines, the scientific name of the soybean aphid. Walter prepared for us isolines that either had one gene alone, a second gene alone, or the two combined in a pyramid. And in 2014, we published a, a paper with this really long title, which basically we tested these varieties in a couple situations. Uh, we left the plots either untreated or we kept them aphid-free by applying foliar insecticide in multiple times. And then in the split plot design, some of those rows got a seed treatment. And this is what we found in terms of yield. So we compared the untreated to the aphid-free. If it's a negative value, that means if we hadn't sprayed the insecticide, we lost yield. And so what you see here is the susceptible. Yeah, we lost yield. We needed insecticide. We got a little bit more uh, protection when we had a seed treatment on top of that. The RAG1 gene and the RAG2 gene alone provided some protection, but it was really the pyramid that, we, that could be grown and planted without a seed treatment and left untreated with a foliar insecticide such that it prevented any aphid outbreaks. So, conclusions from all this published work. One, neonicotinoid seed treatments can provide protection from insect pests, especially if you're in a region like the Mid-South where you're faced with a lot of pests, especially early in the season. A preventative approach for managing soybean aphids is not cost effective. Whether that's a preventative approach that is applying an insecticide a seed before planting or applying a foliar insecticide. Scouting and IPM not only works, but it pays off. And finally, insecticides alone can be replaced for managing this pest. Unfortunately, right now, very little of this trait is available commercially. It's only in boutique. Uh, I don't mean to disparage those companies, but they're small companies compared to the larger companies that provide most of the seed to this region. It would be pretty awesome if we had that technology in the hands of more farmers, especially now, as the previous speaker pointed out, aphids have become resistant to pyrethroids, one of the main class of insecticides that's used to manage them. And with that, I just acknowledge the graduate students, postdocs that have worked on this, and the collaborators that helped with the regional studies as well as the funding sources. And I apologize for going over. Thank you all very much. I, let's start with maybe Aaron. You came all the way. Yeah, yeah. There is. So um, I have a, a graduate student who wrapped up a couple of years ago who's now at South Dakota State, and his dissertation was looking at. Uh, the different biotypes and asking, well, one, is there a, a fitness cost associated with virulence? And there is. And then two, there's this weird thing that he, uh, weird but, but kind, of, kind of magical thing that happens when the two biotypes are on the same plant. And it turns out that if a virulent aphid is on a resistant plant, it shuts down the defensive genes. That therefore allows the avirulent aphid, the susceptible aphid, to survive. And working with some modelers, we showed that that functions like a refuge in a plant. So we grow refuges of susceptible plant in blocks or mixed in the bag to produce a susceptible population to swamp out the virulent resistant population. Turns out that that's kind of hap that is happening, but at the plant level. And if you incorporate that plus a regular refuge and the fitness cost, Turns out that these traits can be very durable, despite the occurrence of virulent aphids in, uh, in North America. And all of that's been published. You can find it at plus one is where we summarize the, in the modeling. Yeah, Michelle?
Yeah. So um, to repeat the question, I might paraphrase it a different way. So you said, looks like when you combine RAG1 and RAG2, that would be the, a really powerful way to manage the aphid. There might be some additive effects. As an entomologist, as an applied entomologist, I would say I think you're emphasizing or you're focusing on the wrong thing. And going back again to our previous speaker who talked about resistance management, entomologists and uh, uh, ecologists and population geneticists for the past 30-some years have been developing the theoretical basis for resistance management. And one of the things that they have, I think, locked in on is that individual traits, regardless of how well they work, to make that resistance durable and useful over a long run should not be released individually. They should be combined. And the thing that I would focus on with this is not it's RAG1 and RAG2, it's a pyramid of two traits. And other breeders and, and, and to some extent Gustavo's work and, and Jessica uh, Hohenstein's work has showed that there are other traits, other RAG genes, and they work better when they're to combined. Why that is at the molecular level, I don't know, but in terms of resistance management, I care because the models and the, uh, suggest that that's the way to get the most durable use of these traits. All right, let's take that again. Thanks.